Hey everybody, today is Monday, January 18th, 2021. My name is Matt Fury and you are listening to The Rough Cut. Well, greetings once again, dear friends. Welcome back to the podcast. If you're new around here, thanks for checking it out. I hope you decide to stick around for a while. If you're the type that likes to talk about editing and filmmaking and all the other things related to making movies and TV shows, I think you'll have a good time. Have a good time all the time. That's my philosophy. And we are definitely going to have a good one today. We have not one, not two, but three, count them, three editors joining us. Craig Alpert, James Thomas, and Mike Giambra from the movie Borat, subsequent movie film. Heretofore referred to as Borat 2 because I can't keep saying subsequent movie film. Now, although Sasha Baron Cohen had stated he was retiring his Borat character back in 2007, largely due to the fact that everybody knows who Borat is and it would be tough to pull off the same feat he accomplished in the original film, it seems that 2020 begged to differ and that the world needed Borat once again. How did they pull that off, especially during a worldwide pandemic? Well, I have just the people you need to talk to about that. But before we do, a little Kazakhstani love for our sponsor, Extreme Music. Since 1997, they have been trusted by media creators from all walks of storytelling to provide them with the very best in production audio, and they can do the same for you. Just head on over to their easy-to-use website, extrememusic.com, as fate would have it, and there you will be able to do a keyword search through their vast catalog of top-shelf tracks from A-list musicians, producers, composers, all that stuff, folks like Atticus Ross, Timbaland, Quincy Jones, Hans Zimmer, and many more. They can help you license whatever you need right there on their website, or with the gentle and reassuring guidance of one of their reps located at an office near you, unless you live in Kazakhstan. In that case, you need to hope the internet is working that day because you got to do it online. But do it, you should. Don't let your next project out the door without making it sound its best by visiting Extreme Music. Now then, so much to learn from our guests today. Not a moment to waste. Here to tell us all about how they brought Borat back are editors Craig Alpert, James Thomas, and Mike Giambra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, where I want to start is with, well, just the nature of this film. You know, lots of films are really security conscious about the story. I mean, you do a Star Wars movie, you do a Marvel movie, there's going to be all kinds of security measures put in place. Being secretive about the fact that you're even doing a movie has to introduce a whole other level of complication and layers to the process. James, you and Craig worked on the original film. How did you find out about this one? Because I think that's an important place to start. And what did you guys have to do to try and keep it all under wraps? The idea for a second movie has definitely been bubbling away for a while. And I guess it kind of really got traction, I suppose, maybe a couple of years ago, I heard them getting more serious about it. And then yeah, I just got a call from Sasha saying, you know, we're going back into production. Um, I think this was probably, uh, wow, I'm trying to figure it out. I mean, I handed over to you in October, right? Mike was was it October of last year? So I think I probably was on from like, September, maybe for, for a month, just to kind of, Sasha wanted to just, you know, they'd shot some preliminary stuff and was like, what do you think? And so I did a month and then uh, Mike dove in to the, uh, the, the, the kind of daily grind of, of, of dailies really for, yeah. for, for a while. And I kind of went off for a bit and then came back in, I kind of remember, I think March, I came back. March. And then it was yeah. Cause of- I, I joined, I think mid, January. So I, I think we all sort of came on at different times. It was like tag, tag, tag teaming. You know, Sasha loves yeah. this idea of multiple writers, multiple editors. Um, and uh, I think it, I think it kind of worked. I think we pulled it off. <laughs> well, what is that like for you guys as editors? The contrast between starting a project and then joining it in progress. Is it tougher in that you're having to sort of get acclimated and sometimes unwind stuff that's already been done before you got there? Or is it a little easier because a lot of the foundational work has been done for you? This one was a little different because I think sort of we we all sort of dug into every scene. All of us, for the most part, watched all of all of the footage, you know, because there's so much material in there that you know, that everybody sort of comes up with something different. So it's always, I think, when you jump on either in the middle of the film or at the beginning of the film, there's, you know, always takes some time to get acclimated. But, you know, there's always a lot of experiments to be had and multiple versions of scenes to be cut. So um, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but we all, we also had our hands in everything. Yeah, I felt like when I jumped on about six weeks 
after they started. I had a daughter and so I wanted to spend time with her and kind of pushed my start date a little later and James was starting pretty much right away and we had a kind of revolving door of guest editors kind of <laughs> editing scenes and trying to see what if things were working or not and um when I hopped on Jason Warner the director he you know asked me to keep up with the dailies but also look at all the footage from that's been shot from all the previous scenes and for me to try my own version of a scene of a cut so I was just trying to catch up to all the previous scenes that were shot and all the new stuff coming in. So by the time everything was shot, I felt like James, Craig, myself, all the editors had to at least take a look at the footage there, try some jokes or try a version that hadn't been tried before. And just we're just auditioning things and seeing what works and what doesn't work. So, you know, doing a film where you can't talk about the fact that you're doing a film, that's one thing. <laughs> doing it where you can't even talk to each other directly and doing it in this pandemic situation how you pull this off i'm i guess we'll find out but that's it's, it's amazing to me so i think the first thing i'd want to know is what were your home setups because clearly you had to do this from home for the most part and how was it that you collaborated because it seems like a lot of collaboration had to be accomplished to get this thing done i think it worked surprisingly well i don't know if you guys agree but we we were all together until mid well, the beginning of March, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of beginning of March is when we, we closed the cutting room down and went remote, yeah. Yeah, and once we went remote, I, I think it all happened so fast that we each just took home a drive. And at the time, we, we weren't, at, at that very moment, we weren't shooting anything. So there wasn't much new material coming in. So we were all working locally. Then we'd sort of pass bins, I think, over Dropbox. Yeah. And then we shut down for a little bit to try to figure out what the next step was. And that's when we decided to start using Jump, the remote desktop program. So we all have our systems at home, but we didn't have to run Avid locally. Everything was run off our machines in Burbank or whatever the location was. And we were all connecting to the same Nexus. So I, I, I think that's the amazing part about this is we're all in 10 different locations working in the same project, opening up the same bin, seeing what everybody's doing. And it, I, I think it works surprisingly well. We worked with two monitors, <laughs> um, so which was, you know, like which was a bit of a challenge. So you, you, you know, just go into full screen mode when you want to watch stuff. But it worked. I think it worked okay. Yeah, I thought it worked pretty great. I mean, when we were uploading and downloading bins from Dropbox, it was a little slow, and you had to kind of keep track of everything. Yeah, I was a little uncertain about using Jump Desktop. It was the first time I. I had used it and it was surprisingly smooth. The only hiccups were, you know, during a pandemic, everyone's using the internet for school and streaming. So there would just be times where the entire server was down or the yeah. internet provider was down. So that was, those were the only hiccups, but it would come back online, you know, a few hours later. Yeah. And the two, and the, the two minor thing was fine. I'm, I've, I'm working on a show now where we can use three through jump. So I don't know why we were limited to two, but I think, um, I mean, we had people working in England connecting. I think it's amazing that you could almost be anywhere in the world, as long as your internet can support it and connect to the same project. And, and, you know, I would say also the only, I mean, that's more from a technical aspect. It, I think it yeah. worked great. The only thing that was maybe difficult was trying to communicate yes. ideas and collaborate on scenes and talk about the story with everybody. So we would have daily zoom meetings uh, every morning where we would talk about uh, our progress, we would call each other, we would text each other, email each other. It's every form of communication all throughout the day and night. You know, we would text Mark in the UK, like, hey, here's where I left off. Can you cut this scene? Um, so it was, the, only, the only trouble was like, hey, you know, Craig, can you come in the room and watch the scene? Does this work? We didn't really get that chance to, uh, to do that. But um, we, we tried to stay as close in communication as possible. But also too, we would have our morning Zoom session. So we would all get on, even if there really wasn't anything to talk about, just so we can all see each other's faces, you know, and mm -hmm. then we had our group text chain that we text throughout the day. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's different working remotely and not being able to walk into someone's room and communicate. And that is the best, you know, that's obviously the best way to do it. But I think, I think we found a way to make this work. I've had discussions before in recent months with people having to work in situations like this. Something I don't think we've talked about before is how an assistant editor functions 
within this model? Like, so as an assistant that's working remotely, what do you have your assistants do for you from wherever they may be? We were really lucky in that we had an incredible team of assistants. Chelsea Dinsdale was our first, uh, Delaney Del Vecchio. Dart and Elliot. And- Brandon, Elliot. And, and yeah, I mean, from a management point of view, I think once we went, it became pretty clear that we needed to be um, central on a central server because it was just going to get so complicated and, and everything, a lot of stuff gets left to the last minute with Sasha. That's his process. He likes to kind of leave things right to the 11th hour. And so I hope that that made their lives a lot easier was the fact that we were all on a central a central server. But just in terms of managing dailies and, you know, getting stuff through from the lab as quickly as possible. And it was a gargantuan task. And Chelsea kind of led the charge on that and just did an outstanding job, I think. Yeah, I think her phone was ringing off the hook. You could hear it sometimes in her voice, the <laughs> exhaustion yeah. when she answered the phone. But it was really amazing that that they pulled this off and they were able to support all of us because there were, I mean, there were a lot of us, you know, we had editors coming on and off just to help with scenes. It was a tight schedule. There was a lot to do. We welcomed all the help we could get and the assistants supported whoever came on and, and they crushed it. They did a great job. Yeah. This is a project where the ground is literally moving underneath your feet. In other words, there are world events that are taking place as you're making this and that's going to influence the film accordingly. And so I'm just kind of curious how that impacted you, how events unfolding with politics, with the election, with mm. the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, we, we did have a, a huge shift in terms of the story of the movie. CPAC, the, the sequence where he, he crashes the Conservative Party conference, was originally designed and written to be the finale of the movie what in fact ended up being the the Giuliani scene. And I think back in April, we were kind of looking through stuff and we found this line from Mike Pence at the podium where he talks about right now, there's only 15 confirmed cases of coronavirus. And as the president said yesterday, we're ready, we're ready for anything. And there was just kind of this pin drop moment where Sasha was like, oh my God, you know, this movie has to be about, it has to acknowledge COVID-19, it has to acknowledge the pandemic. And so that became the end of the first act. And then all the reshoots were kind of informed by the notion that after that scene in the movie, we had to take on the pandemic. And that's probably why we ended up with seven seven editors on the show was because we had such a confined amount, you know, limited amount of time that the feeling was, you know, there was a big debate about should this come out before the election? Uh, And there were two kind of camps some folks thought that maybe we should wait and just take a bit more time. And then there were us, I think, who were kind of pushing quite hard to say, no, this is a really relevant piece of work. Let's try and get it out in, in time before the election. Yeah. And so that's 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 basically what ended up happening. So yeah, to answer your question, Matt, there was a quantum shift in the middle of this production. You know, because originally it there was no mention of obviously the pandemic when it was written, it wasn't happening. So And because of the nature of what Sasha does, I think he very quickly realized, first of all, the political, satirical kind of potential in it, and then just how brilliant it would be to make something that was of the moment. You know, you talk about the zeitgeist, this totally is a movie that (laughs) almost happened in living color. You know, it's crazy how it unfolded. Well, Mike, with so much work to be done, and it sounds like, you know, a small army being thrown at this in conjunction with you three, how do you divide up the work? How do you decide who does what? Does your backgrounds, your unique skill sets as editors come into play? How do they decide who's going to take what aspect of the movie? I think for the most part, it was discussed internally, you know, between the three of us, depending on what was happening, what the priority of the day was. So if we had to get a cut out to a producer, someone would be cutting the reels, doing, you know, Sasha notes, Jason notes. And then if someone was free, they could take on the new scenes. You know, for instance, I would cut a scene and drop it in the reel, and maybe Craig and James would change it, alter it, add a joke, depending on if Sasha remembered a a joke that really killed or there's a story detail that needs to be dropped in. So if you look at it like a reality show or like a, a mockumentary type thing, you can break it down into these two main components. You have the I guess what I would call the bystander moment, the the man on the street stuff, and then the scripted elements that are seem to be sort of the connective tissue to build a narrative out of all of that. 
Do you guys appreciate or enjoy cutting one versus the other? Are there different challenges in working in one type of scene versus another one? For me personally, I've, I've cut on Nathan for you, which is very similar to Borat and some of the Sasha things where it's, it's, you're in this docu comedy world where there's jokes and story and real people and you want to get a sense of that reality. So it's like, I find myself thriving in those conditions and feel very comfortable in it. So I feel like there's a nice balance where like you kind of have the safety and security of a, of a more scripted scene a more like, all right, you have just a very, here's two characters. You have to get some story across in this moment in the tightest, quickest way. And then you can kind of have a, a different experience where you have this documentary side where you're dropped, you know, three hours of footage and you're just watching every little detail, trying to f- extract the best reaction or joke or moment from that, but also try to tell the story within that. So I think it's like fun to juggle between the two or bounce back and forth between the two. Well, in terms of the structure, Craig, most of the time an editor, you know, when they start a project, here's the script. Or if it's a true documentary, it's here's 500 hours of footage of all kinds of different types of assets. Find a story. For you guys, is it literally, here are some major elements that we want to work with, and then those might change along the way? Because it feels like you have to go back and recut a lot of stuff just based on new things happening or a bystander moment playing out a different way than you had anticipated. I think once we shut down and COVID hit, sort of as everything was sort of hitting the world, every sort of current event was just sort of being written into the script. So we just had a group of writers and Sasha and Jason that were just brainstorming ideas just based on what was happening in the world. So the story just sort of evolved as we progressed through the shutdown. So there were scenes that we moved around to just sort of accommodate that. I get beat up a lot if I don't ask about some of the production elements in terms of what you shot. Everyone's always like, well, what what camera did they use? I'm not sure why that's super important, but I know a lot of people ask me to ask (laughs) that. So between those scripted things, I'm assuming you had different cameras because obviously the the bystander stuff and the, the man on the street stuff has to be more run and gun style. So if you could just give us a sense of what are the different types of assets that you were working with in terms of camera formats or media formats that you were given to cut? Well, I know we shot some stuff on iPhones in CPAC. And the rally as yeah. well. Yeah, iPhones and the reception of the hotel Giuliani stuff, That a lot of that was shot on iPhone. A lot of mixed formats. I mean, the rig for the hotel room with Giuliani obviously involved a lot of hidden cameras. I'm not sure exactly what the back ends were on those cameras. I don't know if you guys know, do you know? No. Were we using electric cameras for the interview? This is terrible, isn't it? For Luke and the three main cameras were Alexis. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. But yes, they, they had to adapt a lot, I think. Because then, you know, when COVID hit, there were a couple of scares on set. So we lost the ability to shoot with a couple of our main operators. And so we had to hire local crews. I know that happened on the feed store scene. Right, guys? I think yeah. that, that was a local crew. And, you know, that presented its own challenges in terms of us having to cut around stuff that wasn't shot in a way. You, you know, our guys are very disciplined. Okay, you're on two singles. You're on one single of Borat. You're on single of the subject. You're on a roving kind of two shot. And that works great, right? Because we've always got options. Mm-hmm. But when you have people who are literally hired the morning of the shoot, I think it, it got a little crazy sometimes in terms of who was shooting what. How would this compare to a more traditional scripted project in terms of just the volume of material and dailies and just the shooting ratio versus what ended up in the film? I guess it depends on what kind of scripted show you're working on. A lot of the shows I've worked on have such a large amount of improv, that there is a lot of material that comes in. But on this type of show, it, it just sort of depends on what, what sort of happened that day, how many cameras were being shot. Cameras are usually just rolling the, the entire time we're there because you're just not, you're not sure what Sasha's going to say. You're not sure how the people are going to react. It's more like a documentary, I feel like. Yeah, like, you know, a scene like the rally or CPAC, we would try to edit a scene with the cameras and the footage available, but every week a field producer or a writer that was at the event would say, oh, I've got this footage. Like, why isn't this in the cut? And so (laughs) you have to rely on dozens of people that may have shot the footage to send it to Technicolor, send it to Chelsea to get it to our hands because we don't know what's there, but everyone has an idea of what they shot, but it's we don't have it in the Avid. So yeah, those were the kind of trickier scenes to cut because you'd have a, a cut scene that's working well and you get some new footage that either helps or doesn't help. And it was wild because I think for a scene like the rally, we were getting new clips every week, maybe, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you'd cut something and they'd be like, well, where's this shot? And we don't have it. And then someone 
just sends it from their phone. Yeah. Well, considering the fluid nature of the story, and then also the example you guys just gave where stuff is coming in and you're being made aware that, oh, there's more footage for that. You just don't have it. How do you organize all that? I mean, I know you have the Nexus and you have a central location to keep everything, but what's your method for organizing this material and being able to figure out, I know what's missing here and I can find that pretty easily. I mean, Chelsea did an amazing job just orchestrating everything. And she was not only our point person, but she was talking to all the writers and producers and she would be tracking these things down, making sure that we were notified once they were in the Avid. And I mean, we relied on her tremendously to get us everything we needed. So it was all her doing. Yeah, we just had a lot of sequences, big string outs. Also, after the fact, we would have some scenes transcribed and then put into the script tool. And it was mostly the footage from the first half of the shoot before we shut down that was all transcribed and shot. So that way, if Sasha or Jason asked for a specific line, you could almost do a keyword search in the script. And most of the time it would go right, you know, right to that question, right to that response. Yeah, that was a pretty useful transcription tool was good. I mean, I guess the thing is to, I always make chem rolls. So I just string everything out, you know, old school and just make sure that, because truly what keeps Sasha up at night is that there's a, there's a great, you know, three-star joke that is kind of loitering somewhere that hasn't been unearthed. And so his question to all of us, right, guys, the whole time was like, have you seen everything? You know, he would always ask that question. And I think part of his process of getting each one of us to take a look at stuff was to make sure that he was comfortable, that nothing had had slipped through the net kind of thing. First of all, I love that you said chem roll. I love that there are editors that still do that. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm showing my age. No, and it came up about a month ago. Another editor was talking about doing things in chem rolls, and we had to do a little dissertation on the chem. <laughs> so knowing that Sasha's one of his main concerns is, you know, I put a lot of energy and a lot of effort into making these jokes. Are you sure you've seen all of them? Are you sure you got all of them? Would you use something like Script Sync where you can actually say, look, here's the scene. I can quickly run you through every take or every reading of that line. We used to, and in the past we've done that. So like on a more clearly scripted movie like Grimsby, for instance, you know, the brothers Grimsby, that was something that we absolutely could do because it was really a more of a traditional film. But with something like this that was evolving so quickly, I think to transcribe everything and have an assistant go through and put those locators, those nodes on everything, which is super useful. Don't get me wrong. It's literally, when you're on a scripted movie, it's the best thing ever. You know, director comes in and says, okay, show me all the takes of this line read and you'll just pop, 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 pop. And they select one and off you go. But with this, I think, you know, we'd still be there. We'd still be doing it now, yeah. you know, for months to come. The transcription was something I asked for on Nathan for you somewhere in season two or three. And going into this, I was like, I just think we're going to need it. I think so many editors are going to be hopping on. It's going to save us so much time if we could just find... When did this person talk about Trump? You type in Trump, you find it. And it just saved us so much time and allowed us to just kind of keep flowing and, and keep keep cutting. Yeah, I mean, we ran out of time, I think, once COVID hit and a lot of stuff was being shot so quickly. So the earlier... The earlier stuff definitely got, got more love in terms of those transcriptions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but the later reshoot material was, was really by the seat of our pants at, at some points, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we talked at the macro level in terms of managing material. I'm sure each of you individually has your own methods, techniques for just keeping track of versions, for how you manage stuff within the Avid. Do you have a system for how you manage all this stuff story-wise within your timeline? Well, we have a lot of versions, certainly since we're all sort of digging in and cutting different versions of the scene. So I think we're, yeah, we're all keeping our own separate version of scenes in our folders. And then our reels, we would sort of version up after every time we had a screening or some sort of major event where we show the film to people or something like that. So essentially we just made a lot of copies of a lot of sequences and we just sort of notate in the comments about, you know, like bigger things that were changed. I think I, I mean, I usually drop a yellow locator and put down notes of things that I don't want to forget and everyone sort of use locators as well. But I think, uh, I think we did a nice job of organizing your term versioning up, if you could just add a little color to that, what does that mean in, in a film when you version up? Sure. So, I mean, essentially, even though films now are no longer released on film, we still sort of break up the movie into reels, which is just sort of 
chunks. It's less important now about how, how long they are, but it used to be important that, you know, they stay around 20 minutes, 21 minutes. So in this movie, I think we were working on six reels, even though, of course, when we started, they were an hour long, but we knew that they would get shorter. So you just name like real one, version one, version two. And, um, and we previewed a lot, even though this was a pandemic and it was hard to screen in the United States, we still found ways to screen the movie to audiences. And at that point, that's when we would usually version up to version two, because we always made substantial changes after a screening for an audience. And I don't know what version we ended up on. I'm not sure. I don't remember. 14. <laughs> yeah, 14. We're version up so fast and because we were having multiple screenings a week, you know, like out of the country and virtual screenings here. And it was pretty interesting how we did that. <laughs> and it's a good way of tracking because oftentimes, you know, we'll tweak stuff substantially and then the thinking will be, oh, hang on, that scene's not working as well now in the context, the new context of how the movies evolve. And so it's a very quick way of Mike, Craig, or any of the other guys being able to go back and say, okay, well, that version existed in, you know, 12.7, and you can just quickly go back into the reels and reinstate it. So it's a, way, it's a really effective way of tracking. Yeah, and usually somebody knew where something was. <laughs> yeah, good job. You ask James, Mike, and you go to Chelsea, you go to the assistant, someone would always remember where something was because we were editing at such a rapid pace and making so many changes and everyone had their hands in things that um, I think it actually was organized quite well. <laughs> so. One of the challenges of doing well, any film, really, is that as you make changes downstream, something that you had in the first act might not make sense anymore. Or something that um, you had in the first act and you, you were tightening that up, there was some expository thing there that explained something that happened in later acts. Is it somebody's responsibility just to like watch the thing over and over again? Like, no, wait, you can't take that out. As you said, you have so many different editors working on so many different elements of the film. It seems like you run a really high risk of something like that happening. Mostly everyone was working in their own bins because usually we'd have an editor, one of the additional editors, just solely focus on one of the big scenes and spend a week on that. And within that time, we could even make a major story change in, in a certain other part of the movie. So, you know, James, Mike, and I just always made sure to keep our our eyes on what was being cut and we were responsible for inserting scenes into the into the reels and make sure that they work story wise so yeah we're watching the movie quite a bit <laughs> because of the accelerated nature of the film because you were hitting a deadline that just we're trying to hit a deadline that could not be moved working on sound like how much work did you have to do on sound whether it was temp or finished how much did you feel you had to do because i know it seems like editors more and more in picture are doing more sound work yeah i mean what one of the great pleasures of this style of filmmaking i think is that we as editors take a lot of responsibility for the sound you know we, we, we have to produce temp mixes because we are previewing uh, often we only i think temp mix once on the film i think we did it once the first time to sort of just get a base for cl clean things up and then after that all the screenings were you know straight out of the avid and some people don't like doing that. I, I personally, I get a real kick out of it because I think actually that marriage between sound and picture, you can't in modern filmmaking just say, okay, sound will just take care of this. As an editor, as a picture editor, it's such an integral part of, of what we do, music, voiceover, um, and also to be reactive. You know, we, we had to turn around new lines of voiceover. You know, Sasha had this set up at home on an iPad. I think it's called Frankie. And he'd have an idea, I've had an idea. And then he'd literally, you know, record this thing up on the Dropbox in, in 20 seconds in the movie within 20 seconds. So, you know, I, I think we all, um, well, I can't talk for you guys, but I, re I really enjoy that. I love that part of the process. And I did do it. We had a great sound crew led by Andrew Cristofaro. And we had a great sound mixer towards the end, Laura Hirschberg, that came in and Drew and his crew, Sonny and everyone else, they would just feed us effects and we would cut in because every time we would turn over the show to them, by the time they update the changes to their cut, we, um, we were... <laughs> we moved on. <laughs> yeah, we, changed were, so much. we blew way past yeah. that. So I know they, they had a really tough job. <laughs> they, had a, they did an outstanding job because there's a whole load of rules that Sasha has about sound, you know, in terms of can't sound too much like a movie. And Andrew had, had led the team on the first movie. And so he understood 
all of those ideas and it was just it was so cool to just work with them with people who got it right from the outset you weren't explaining anything to them yeah and they they, they did a just an incredible job yeah so sasha wakes up in the middle of the night with these great ideas records them sends them off to you you've got to find a way to make them fit into the voiceover i love that you said that he doesn't want it to sound too much like a movie but then he's also working with elements again those man on the street reality shoots where you don't have as much control over the audio or it's possible that you're dealing with audio that's wild and it needs to be fixed what about the adr process for the film how much different was that for a film like this versus again a more traditional one and one done in a less chaotic environment like we've been put under with the pandemic you know there's a fine line making a movie like this and and we try not to introduce any artifice unless we absolutely have to so if if, if something doesn't work from a technical point of view then we'll go back because it's inaudible and we'll re-record it. Mm -hmm. You know, Sasha's mostly recording BO from his house and anything technical, and Maria was recording stuff from her house. We never went anywhere to do that. You just reminded me of something I wanted to ask you about, and luckily enough, you're here, so I can ask you. I had never really realized this, because I can be pretty slow sometimes. His native language that he's speaking in the film, you, you assume it's Kazakh or Russian, something I, I don't speak, so what would I know? But he's actually speaking Hebrew. Is that correct? And because he's actually speaking a real language, does that take away the freedom of being able to move some things around or change what he's saying in the subtitles? Or do you still go, you know what? We can just change this subtitle a little bit in the scripted scene. It'll be a little punchier. It'll be a little funnier. I mean, maybe you guys can speak to it more because you worked on the first one. But I felt like I just was focused a bit more on the delivery and sort of the emotion of what he was saying rather than the actual translation. I've had to cut some foreign language stuff before, but this time I felt like, and I had to ask, I was like, can I just freely cut this and it's not going to make sense in Hebrew? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. Like, okay. But I just wanted to make sure that we were getting the, the delivery right, the emotion right before we really started focusing too much on the translation. And sometimes he would say, you know, in Hebrew and you'd get a little bit of a Michael Pence or Trump in there. So that is like, it has to be the line if that's what he's saying. Yeah, I, I agree, Mike. It's, it's all about how it scans, you know, so the intonation of it, it, whatever language, and it is Hebrew that he's speaking, and Maria Tutar is speaking Bulgarian, that's her native tongue. And in the first movie, Azamat, Ken Dapvian, who played Azamat, he was speaking Armenian. And so that was a mashup of Hebrew from Sasha and Armenian from Ken. And I know people who speak Hebrew get a real kick out of it because the translation is often in the zone, but with some nuances that are slightly different. And I know after the first movie, some people kind of were getting an extra layer of enjoyment out of the movie. You know, having worked with Sasha for so long, do you feel like you understand his comedic sensibilities that you already have sort of a shorthand built up between the two of you? Yeah, I mean, I consider myself incredibly fortunate. I, the first freelance gig I ever had as an editor was on a show called The 11 O'Clock Show, which was this just tiny little TV show in London that no one knew anything about. And Channel 4 at the time basically gave a whole bunch of kids some money and some office space in Waterloo near London and said, okay, we want three times a week, half hour live TV show. And we were all kind of like, okay. <laughs> um, and then Sasha came along and Ricky Gervais were the two people that came out of that show. So yeah, I think it's just, it's just an evolution, right? It's just, we kind of grew up thinking the same things were funny. And he taught me so much about it comedy you know and i'm just incredibly grateful to have been along for the for the ride but i do think it developed you develop a um an understanding of of you know how the rhythm of something works but it's just really a question it's like growing up to get you know that was 22 years ago so it's like it's just you know making mistakes and it was all ali g at the beginning you know borat came along probably there were rumblings of borat towards the end of the second season of of the 11 o'clock show, but then that character first fully got realized going into the, we made a special for channel four and then HBO, when we went to HBO, they, then there was skits from Borat across that whole show. So yeah, it's been, a, it's, it's been a while. <laughs> Rumblings of Borat would make a pretty good movie title. <laughs> right. Or Ali G had, which was, you know, I know you guys have seen the original Ali G movie, but it's, that for me still is one of his best characters that never fully got the movie treatment. That there was this movie idea kicking around for Ali G where he went off and joined um, like an Al Qaeda training camp 
in Pakistan, and the movie was called Ali Jihad, and it was brilliant. I don't think I'd want to edit on location for that one, but that's uh, that would have been something. <laughs> well, you mentioned that so he's taught you a lot about comedy. I know it was kind of difficult because you weren't together, but did you pick up anything from each other in terms of techniques or processes or like, oh, I never thought to do something like that or use that tool in that way? Any information passed on between the three of you? Well, the subcaps I'd never used. I just always used the title tool, but on the show, we're using the subcap feature. I know that's an odd to say but i i'd never uh i'd never seen that before that was chelsea's idea and it actually at first i was kind of like a bit resistant but it worked great do you find that as working editors a lot of the new things you pick up are actually from assistants because they're a little closer to new developments new technology yeah i find that for me yeah i uh this is my first avid project so i, I come from a premiere world so i bugged chelsea dozens of times a day like how do i do this how do i do that like carrying over into the avid world it was, it was very confusing to me but by the end i i really got it and we're happy to have you thank you <laughs> happy to be here well thank you chelsea i think i owe her a hat or something one thing i didn't ask you about i mean i asked you a little bit about working in audio in your own systems what about your collaboration with audio post how different was that and what sort of hoops did you have to jump through to get audio post done whether it's you know, just dialogue editing uh, incorporating the score things like that I mean, I don't know that it was really that much different. Was it other than we just weren't all together and we were moving? It was moving so fast that I think maybe on a more traditional movie, we may have integrated tracks from sound a bit sooner and started carrying them in the, in the Avid. We were kind of resistant. And I know Drew has just got the patience of a saint, our supervisor, because he was like, OK, guys, I get it. Whereas most supervisors would be like, no, we've done all this work. We need to hear it. You know, Sasha needs to get used to it. Jason needs to get used to it. People need to hear this stuff. But I think Mike, Craig, and I felt that we were like evolving so quickly that to start integrating some of these tracks, frankly, we just didn't have the headspace at, at certain points. But then it became clear that we needed to, to do that because we didn't want any surprises when we got to the stage. You know, Sasha, again, is very aware of things like Foley, and he doesn't want Foley added. And so we, we, we wanted to get as much stuff in terms of the sound effects into the track. So... Jason, Sasha, the writers, everybody could get used to sound field. The big difference really was actually mixing the movie because this was the first movie I've worked on where we um, were not on the dub stage with the mixer. So because Laura mixed up at Skywalker alone in a room. So we were monitoring through this program called Clearview. So it, it's it's like we were virtually at the mix. And on the Apple TV, you could listen to it in six track. But on your laptop, it was in stereo. So it was really the first time that we we were... We were monitoring the mix and we were there with them through video chat, but we were not in the in the room. And that was just something very, very different. <laughs> so you were watching the mix on Apple TV? Yeah, we had the ability to do that. But it worked surprisingly well, I thought. Yeah, so they would stream it through the secure app and they could actually stream it in six tracks. So I could sit in my living room, even though I had a tough time doing it because I have three younger kids. And this movie... <laughs> um, it's rated for kids over three, but um, yeah, so a lot of the time I sat in my home office here with headphones on and listened to it in stereo. And then twice James, myself and Jason went to Sony and they streamed the mix down there just so we could hear what it would be like on a, on a dub stage. But that was really only just to confirm everything was okay. But yeah, it was a, it was a full virtual mix, you know, as well as a virtual color timing session as well. And I guess it kind of worked from a sound point of view because, you know, we're not releasing the movie theatrically. So the idea of a big 5-1, all singing, all dancing mix wasn't really appropriate. So, and because of the nature of this documentary idea, I think it lent itself to monitoring at home, you know, on a decent pair of near fields stereo speakers. Yeah. Well, something I should have asked you earlier, of all the different elements of the film, there are things that demand their own look could be security camera footage or it's uh, you know newsreel archival stuff who gets to determine what the look and the feel of that is i guess that there were some visual ideas that carried over from the first movie right some some stuff that we kind of established which was any newsreel footage that was representing kazakhstan had a particular look and so we ended up very old school treatment we would literally dump it onto vhs and then ingest it back into the uh into the avid and there was you know, we went too many generations sometimes and it looked like crap and there was no definition and you were kind of losing some of the visual details. But I think 
it just evolved, right, Mike? I mean, like when you were cutting the Nanja Bio scene at the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, you guys came up with that fantastic idea of that scene being, you know, more from a CCTV point of view. So, yeah. I mean, when they shot, yeah, they shot this scene at the high angle. So Jason was like, let's desaturate it. Let's add some, you know, some camera um, overlay to try to make it feel like a, like a security camera. Um, and so just experimenting and, and there's some things from the writers or Jason or Sasha that they have references. They'll send us like, we should try to make it look a little bit more like this and try to make it feel like even the cartoon kind of has, it's, it's, it's not an American Disney cartoon, you know, it feels a little bootleg and that was, you know, heavily researched and, and, and thought over. So after having gone through all of this, you've worked with Sasha before on similar projects but every project has its own unique elements, and this is certainly no exception. What will you take away from your time on this film, whether it's just part of the craft, any new technology, new process you learned, or just new insights on how to do your job? I think being remote certainly taught me how much I miss collaborating with my fellow editors. Mm-hmm. Like, there's nothing, you know, it worked, and Evercast, you know, we haven't talked about Evercast, but that that's a great piece of technology. Uh, Clearview was great. Zoom obviously played a a big part but the, i don't think there's anything that can get away from just walking into michael craig's room and sitting down with a cup of coffee and going hey you know did you see the cut of such and such and mm-hmm. so th- that's my takeaway from this is i can't wait for this damn pandemic to be over so we can get back <laughs> into a cutting room because it's it works and it's really great but there's something about also your avid is there the whole time it's in your house and you kind of even at like one o'clock in the morning when you're going to get a glass of water, you're like, well, I could just jump on. And I don't know. I don't know what you guys feel about it, whether it's better or worse. I, I certainly... Yeah, it's a bit of both. I mean, working remotely on this, I kind of was starting to see future projects happening this way too. And like, well, maybe they won't want to rent post offices. We will work from home. Uh, I hope not. I, I, I agree with James. It's better to collaborate with people and, and see everyone's smiling faces every day. Craig, yes. your thoughts on this? Well, I did find myself working a lot more hours working from home. <laughs> uh, starting earlier, um, and in later, and it was fine. We were having a great time. But um, yeah, I, 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 I miss being able to just walk out of your office and go into the middle of the sort of bullpenish and just start talking about the movie you know because every time you'd want to do it either you'd have to call someone or facetime someone and then you'd realize you'd want to be talking to someone else but then they're busy speaking to someone else so it's it's um it's a challenge making a movie like this when you're all separated you know fortunately we sorted out and did a great job but i do look forward you know being in a room together with everybody else (laughs) i mean it worked because we all kind of like each other i think it would be tricky if if you weren't getting on with your your co-collaborators because like craig and i and, and mike we, we would be talking like i don't know five six times a day sometimes yeah. it's like and you do feel the act of making a phone call is kind of intrusive you know it's like whereas just hanging out with someone talking is it's it's it seems a little easier well, no, that's funny. Yeah, because every time I would make a call to someone, I'd always think about, are they around and like, can they answer right now? And can they speak? Because you don't know what's happening at the other side. Whereas you could just barge into somebody's office if you're, <laughs> if you're in the same, hello. Yeah. <laughs> but Okay, before we close it out, there's one thing I need to know. After all this time working in the film, the voice, do you just hear that voice in your head still? <laughs> Mike does. <laughs> I do because I was doing all the temp uh, Borat voiceover. You, the entire you did movie, the temp. So you gonna I give it? all the temp stuff. Well, let's hear it. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> give me a line. I kind of let me think of a line in the film. I've tried to like wipe it like a hard drive, just totally wipe it out of my mind. Um, did you get that job because you do the best voice? Does everybody have a Borat? I think everyone has a Borat. I've heard everyone's Borat, and I think I was eventually assigned to do all of it. Um, yeah, just because a lot of the time Sasha's not available to recording, he just wants us to record something. So we would um, we just harass Mike to do it. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then we get it in the neck for where did that line of voiceover come from? That wasn't that yeah. wasn't in the script. Yeah, I think Mike's was the least offensive. I yeah, Mike's Mike's was, Mike's was great, and I was I did it on the <laughs> yeah. first movie, and it was a pain. So I was really happy that Mike took that particular 
mantle on. Yeah. Come on, let's have- My time on this podcast was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it may surprise you to know how often editors do get called upon to do voices for both temp and final mixes. Then again, they don't usually sound like that. Nice work and a big thank you to James, Craig, and Mike. Those guys definitely know how to have fun and make a funny movie. And I have no doubt we'll be visiting them together or individually again in the future. Time now for me to remind you, as if you didn't already know, that Avid Media Composer has never been more affordable, accessible, or powerful. If you're just starting out in a little light on cash... Stop going to Starbucks so much, dummy. I'm sorry. You go get your latte. And then download Avid Media Composer first for free. It is the best way to learn Avid editing without spending a cent. And if you're ready to take on the complete power of Avid Media Composer, sign up for a low-cost monthly or annual subscription. Links in the show notes for both. Well, that'll do it for now. I still want to hear from you if you have any suggestions, ideas, yes, even criticisms, be gentle, for and about the show. You know how to find me. And thanks to the miracle of podcasting, I know how to find you. So until we meet again, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut.